They know what they want to prove. So any uh, data, any results, any readings which do not agree with what they want to find, they rub them out. They don't even record them. They just throw them away. And that's why you never find truth. You only find what you want to find. To be fair, to be rational, to be wise, you have to be objective, have no vested interest at all in what you're finding, and to take down the data objectively and fairly. So you don't contemplate or reflect yet. You gather data first of all. And only when you've gathered the very fine data of stillness and peace, then you contemplate, then you reflect. Contemplation and reflection are best done at the end of the meditation, at the end of the experiment. When you've got all the data in, then you think, what was that, what did that mean? That's when insight arises. Not at the beginning of the meditation, not in the middle, at the end. So I'll talk about that later when I give some more teachings on insight meditation. But this is what we do. Oh, actually, you've got some other questions here. That's the difference between meditation, contemplation, and reflection. Two, I try my best to meditate throughout the retreat, but sometimes when saturation comes, is that possible? Can we move back to contemplation and reflection? Or will that ruin the whole purpose of meditation and retreat? No, you can contemplate and reflect. You can have what I call playtime. Just when you're a young girl, a young boy, when you were at school, you'd go to school, your lessons early in the morning, mid-morning you have playtime. And then you go back to class, then you'd have lunch, and then in the mid-afternoon you'd have playtime again. Why do they still have playtime in college, in universities, in schools? Because you can't expect to be able to concentrate on the lessons for 24 hours a day. If you did, the kids will go crazy. Which is why we, even in the retreat, we have playtime. This is part of playtime. This is why I tell funny stories. Because when you laugh and you relax afterwards, you relax, you haven't been trying to meditate, and you can meditate much better afterwards. While we have lunch, while we have a rest after lunch. So give yourself playtime. A cup of tea. Or do some walking. Don't be serious and strict 24 hours of the day. It just does not work. And these great forest monasteries where these amazing monks, I thought I'd have to be mindful 24 hours of the day. But I saw people like Ajahn Chah, and he wasn't serious. When it came to tea time, it was fun time, rest time. Even the most serious and strict meditation master, Ajahn Mahabur, when I went to visit his monastery, he had to be very mindful all day. But when it came to tea time, he sat down with the monks and told jokes. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. His reputation was being really fierce. But when it came to tea time, okay, rest. And it was wonderful because he knew, as now I know, that is the way to develop peaceful states of mind. If you keep trying, trying, trying all the time, you won't be able to do it. You'll get dull, you, your mind will rebel. As one person said the other, uh, during the interview time, your mind goes on strike. <laughs> you just can't do it. So have playtime. You have playtime, the mind gets refreshed, you take up the task afterwards, and you can carry on making progress. There might come a time when your meditation really gets hot. You don't need playtime then, but it becomes natural, effortless. You just keep, want to keep on meditating. If that happens, marvellous, carry on. If you feel you need playtime, you're getting a bit dull, things aren't working, have playtime. The third, can a person who has got good meditation practice and experience still not practice good human values and loving kindness? Thank you. I think it's impossible. If someone's got good meditation practice, they have to have loving kindness. Because loving kindness is part of letting go. 
That's what letting go is. Kindness, generosity is letting go. You know, I've said this before, we don't have donation boxes in my monastery in Perth. We have letting go boxes. We have met meta boxes. <laughs> so people can practice meta, letting go. <laughs> Very good. The facts, my goodness. I'll let it go. <laughs> so this is actually how we practice. And if we're really practicing well, it is letting go, it is um, better. So if you really are practicing well, that's a sign that you've understood something, you're getting peaceful, you get so much kindness. When you're very peaceful in meditation, no one can make you angry. This is actually why sometimes we test people out. If they've got a good meditation, they come and say, I jump from, I've just got into jhanas. I say, you stupid idiot, someone like you can't, you're getting it all wrong, that is not jhana. And if they say, what? Who are you to say that? I say, yeah, right, you're not jhana. But if they, <laughs> if they say, oh, okay, Ajahn Brahm, that might be. <laughs> because when you're really peaceful and soft and calm, you can't get upset. You've got so much happiness, so much peace. It's like a person has won the Malaysian lottery and you're a millionaire. How can you get upset if you're a millionaire? Oh, life is so wonderful. Or if you've fallen in love. If you've fallen in love, you found your spiritual partner in life. And you find you've got the sack. Who cares? I'm in love. You can't get upset when you're that happy. The saying, getting into deep meditation is better than being in love. Oh, so nice. You just can't get upset. And you see other people. Oh, how can I help you? So you get lots and lots of compassion and kindness and generosity when you get in deep meditation. Next question. Can you please explain a bit on the third and fourth links of dependent origination? What is the difference between consciousness, third link and number rupa? Fourth link. Any overlapping? Thank you. Okay, what's actually happening there? That consciousness is like the passive side of the mind. Nama rupa is the active side of the mind. But it's also the object of consciousness. You know, of Nama Rupa, one of the most important things of that is Chaitanya, will. Also Manasikara, attention, is what the mind does. Look at Nama Rupa as the objects of consciousness. Consciousness is actually the screen. Nama Rupa is the, the movie on the screen. The point is here, you can't have a movie without the screen. You can't have, well, you can have a screen without the movie, but it's like a, a white screen. But it's still, you have to have something on the screen. You can't have consciousness without an object of consciousness. You can't have an object of consciousness without consciousness. That's why it's called, they're de mutually dependent. If you want to ask more about that, you can come up later. Ben Ajahn, can I elaborate the skill and ways of getting into the center of pain, physical and mental. In meditation, what is in the center of pain? Aha! I'll ask the last question first. In the center of pain, there is nothing. Emptiness. That's why it's a great place to hang out. So, you can, to go in the center of pain, again, notice the flow of the mind which is always going away from things. We go away from this moment. We can't wait to have lunch. We go away from this, I want to get rid of this body, go somewhere else. I want to get rid of this moment, I want to go into thought. We're always going away from things. We're always on the run. That's called the movement of the mind. Instead of going away from things, we go into things. We go into the moment, we go into the silence, we go into the body where there's no more body left. We go into the center. We go into the middle of pain. Notice when you have pain, there's always that tendency to go somewhere else, to run somewhere else, to try and get rid of that pain. Not to accept it, but to get rid of it. That's why it gets worse. There's two parts of pain, the mental part and the physical part. 
The mental part is, I don't want this, why me, when's this going to go, it's not fair. That's the mental part of the pain, the complaining. The physical part is just that, just feeling. If you run away from the pain, it gets worse. If you go towards the pain, move the mind towards it rather than away, you find it gets less. And in fact, if you can break into the center of it, it disappears altogether. Try present moment awareness with the pain. Go into the center of time with the pain. Just now. Because this pain is already here. It's come. You can't get rid of it because it's here. In the present moment, there's no problem with pain anymore. You're stuck with it. It's only when we think, how long is this going to last? I can't stand it any longer. When we involve time with pain, it gets worse. You know, I remember going to see movies when I was a young boy, before I became a monk. Sometimes they would just take this person into the torture chamber. And they'd tell this, po- this person, after we finish with you, you'd wish you'd never been born. Heard that before? Yeah. After I'm finished with you here, you'd wish you'd never been born. You're a Buddhist. You don't want to be born again. <laughs> the whole point to wish you'd never been born. <laughs> but you don't have to look for torture for that because life is torture. There's always aches and pains and stuff going on. When you realize the first noble truth, when you really understand the truth of dukkha, yes, you'd wish you'd never been born. <laughs> But the point is here that uh, suffering, when we go into the centre of it, it gets less and less and less and less. So go into the centre of time. That's one of the ways into the centre of pain. I'll leave it there for now. Are there, I've got two, are there specific meditations to help us control anger, attachments and jealousy? Yep, meta meditation overcomes anger. Letting go meditation attaches, uh, let's go of attachments. Not me, not mine, not the self. And jealousy, you say again, from anatta. What are you being jealous about? Because it's not me, not mine, there's nobody in here. So who wants to be jealous? The other one is like mudita. So if someone else becomes enlightened, isn't that wonderful? The person sitting next to you has become enlightened before you have. Oh, isn't that wonderful? We've got one more enlightened being in this world. Stop thinking, why them? I am good as her. I, look, she hasn't even got up in the morning. and She's already enlightened. It's unfair. I've worked so hard. Oh, I've gone through so much pain. I've gone through so many retreats. And this is their first retreat and they've got enlightened. It's not fair. <laughs> so don't think like that. <laughs> so... Those are some of the meditations. Metta obviously gets rid of anger. Actually, all these meditations, they get rid of everything. If you do metta meditation, breath meditation, letting go meditation, all the defilements are all abandoned by every meditation. As Buddhists, we are supposed to look inward so much so that we can become self-orientated. No, no self-orientated. <laughs> they got self aware. Whereas our Christian friends are so warm, kind, and ever ready to lend a helping hand and reach out to others, as long as you convert. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a price tag on some Christian compassion. They'll be kind to you as long as you convert and agree with them. So it's not real kindness. If it's real kindness, I'll be kind to you even if you stay as a Buddhist for the rest of your life. Now, if that's your Christian friend, you've got a fine Christian friend, someone who really understands Christianity. A lot of time it's just a means to an end. It's compassion to get converts. That's why as a Buddhist, you should be kind and compassionate and reach out to your Christian friends, your Muslim friends, your Hindu friends, not wanting to convert them at all. I'm going to be kind to you, care for you. As a Muslim, I don't want you to change. I love you for who you are. And that's what compassion is. If it's I'm being compassionate to you as long as you come to my church, as long as you change who you are, 
That's not compassion. That's sneaky business. <laughs> and Buddhists are compassionate and warm. We do reach out. No, I've reached out all the way from Perth to come to KL. That's a pretty long hand. And I've just seen on the boards over there, you're reaching out with orphanages. You go to, uh, to was it to Burma? People go to India. They help out orphanages. They help out with old people's homes. We give our organs to others. Some of the Christians don't like giving their organs. We reach out. We give even our body for others. So don't downplay the compassion of Buddhists. Buddhists are incredibly compassionate. And I think the Buddhists are the most compassionate people in the world. Because when we give, we never make a big fuss and bother about it. We build hospitals. We actually support hospitals. But we don't put a big cross on it to say, look, this is what we've done. We're humble givers. And sometimes people mistake that for not giving at all. We are incredibly compassionate. How do we apply mindfulness to our daily activities? You don't apply mindfulness, it happens. As you get more and more peaceful, you get more and more aware. As you get more and more aware, you see more things. As you see more things, mindfulness just happens. Not just mindfulness, but wisdom as well. You see what needs to be done. You're sensitive to the people around you. You're sensitive to the needs of your husband, your wife, your parents, your children. Mindfulness happens. You're aware. You're alert. Please give some practical guidelines of how to follow up with our meditation after this retreat. We haven't ended yet. (laughs) My goodness, whoever wrote this is already six or seven days ahead of themselves. You may not have a time after this retreat. You may die on this retreat. (laughs) Or you may get enlightened on this retreat. And if you get enlightened, you won't go back to your family. You say, Ajahn Bam, please ordain me. So you may not have it after this retreat. It might go on forever or never. So leave that one alone. Ajahn Bam, you were saying effortless today. What do you mean by that? How do you use the right effort? Is it the same? Aha. Uh-huh. Effortless is the... Well, look, what are the four right efforts? The four right efforts is whatever it takes to abandon unwholesome states, to keep out unwholesome states, to actually to arouse wholesome states and to maintain those wholesome states you will find that not doing is one of the best ways of fulfilling right effort. Wholesome states come up and they stay. Too much doing and unwholesome states come in your mind. If you strive in this meditation, you get frustrated, angry, grumpy. Is that a wholesome state? If you let go, abandon, relax, you get wholesome states in the mind. That is right effort, according to the Buddha. The Buddha was very wise, the best teacher that ever has been or will be. He said, you define right effort by its results. Whatever it takes to abandon unwholesome, akusula states, to make sure they don't arise in the future, to uh, what is it, arouse wholesome states, kusula dhammas, and to maintain them. That is called right effort. Sometimes the people mistake right effort with striving, with worldly effort. This is unworldly effort. You find if you really let go, if you're compassionate, you abandon controlling, wholesome states come up because you're going against craving the source of unwholesome things. You're going against the sense of ego, conceit, self, me, mine, from which all unwholesome states arise. You let go. Ajahn Bhav, is an eight precept to breaking the precepts when he or she uses powder or lotions due to dry skins? Is health drinks, mild and horlicks, tea and coffee considered food? You're not breaking your, your precepts as long as it's just for medicinal purposes. In other words, you've got very dry skin. If you don't put the powder on, it is going to sort of be just uncomfortable for you. But if it's to make you look nice, if you dye your hair because you don't like being white hair, if you sort of put stuff over your face because you don't want anyone to see the pimples, or then even if you put some deodorant on because you've got compassion for the person sitting next to you, and that's fair enough. <laughs> but it's, 
It's not there for <laughs> it's not there just for to make yourself beautiful.